Well, good evening. We're going to look together this evening at uh, John chapter 13, the passage which uh, Ewan has read of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And I want to uh, read from verse 12, John chapter 13 and verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. And our theme this evening is the humility of the master and the humility of his servants. Uh, when I was in college, uh, one of our tutors uh, told us a story about a, a minister who had preached one evening at a chapel in Wales, and uh, he had preached on the theme of humility. And after the service, he went to the door and was shaking hands with people as they were leaving. Uh, and one man came to him and shook his hand very warmly and said, I really enjoyed uh, that sermon on humility because that's one of my strong points. Now, I don't think it's really any of our strong points. It wasn't the strong point of the disciples. Uh, we find it much easier as they did to be proud rather than to be humble. And this passage, which perhaps is very familiar to us, is an amazing passage. Uh, Jesus is with his disciples for the last hours before he is betrayed and arrested and uh, tried and condemned and taken out to be crucified. All those things are on his mind and heart as he's in the upper room. Uh, he's going to institute what we know as the Lord's Supper, breaking bread and uh, sharing wine and speaking of his sufferings and his death. Judas is, is still there. He hasn't left the gathering yet. And yet Jesus undertakes this remarkable action of washing the disciples' feet. All the gospel writers uh, tell us a lot uh, about the, the last week of Jesus' life. And John uh, specializes particularly and focuses particularly upon the last night, the, the upper room. And, and there are chapters here where we, we hear of what Jesus said as well as what he did when he was with them in the upper room. Uh, one man says that that upper room was a place of heavenly and divine impression and communion. Jesus knew what was coming. The disciples didn't really fully understand. Um, but there, were, there was something very special about that place uh, and about the whole focus of our Lord. And yet at the same time, it was also a very ordinary situation. It's often like that in our, our Christian life. We, there may be deeply spiritual things that impress us and uh, which warm our hearts. But that doesn't remove us from the context of daily life and, and the reality of the things that need to be done. And it was like that for Jesus and the disciples. They'd come in from Bethany uh, to Jerusalem. And if the weather was dry, the roads were dusty. If it had been raining, the roads were wet and muddy. And so when they arrived at the place where they were to have the Passover meal, uh, then there were practical things to be done. The host would have provided a, a pitcher of water and a basin and a towel. And uh, it was necessary to wash the feet of those who had gathered that night. And uh, that work was a, a servant's work. It was a lowly task. When John the Baptist wanted to stress how much greater the one who was coming was than he was, he said that he was not worthy to stoop down and untie the thongs of the sandals of the one who came after him. I'm not worthy to be his servant, he said. And so it, it was a menial task that needed to be done. And uh, as they were there, the, the meal was about to be served and, and no one had offered to undertake the task that night. 
um, and there was a reason for that. It was their ordinary reluctance, you know, how sometimes when at home you perhaps have a family together, you've had a big meal, not so much in COVID times, but there were times in the past when that happened. And there's all the washing up to be done if you haven't got a mechanical maid to do it for you. And you know how you sometimes hesitate, you'd be very glad if somebody else said, well, I'll do it today. Um, and the disciples were like that, they didn't want to do it. But it wasn't just because it was a, a difficult task to do, to, to wash the, the large feet of men that were dirty and to dry them. And none of, us, none of the disciples wanted to do it, but there were also other things going on. They, they were having a dispute, for instance, about which of them was to be greatest. Uh, James and John and their mother uh, had actually made a request to Jesus uh, that they should have the best seats in the coming kingdom. And obviously, if you aspire to greatness, you, you don't want to take on a menial task like washing the feet. It's almost a, a declaration that you're really not in the running for greatness. And Judas is there and he knows that the time is coming when he is going to keep the promise he's made to be the traitor and to betray uh, his Lord and Master. And so they're all waiting. And uh, as they're waiting, suddenly Jesus acts. Uh, he gets up from the table and uh, he begins to, uh, to prepare to wash the disciples' feet. Uh, he takes off his outer clothing. He wraps a towel round his waist. And the moment that he has acted, none of them is able to say, oh, it's all right, I'll, I'll do it. I'm sorry I didn't do it before, but I'll do it now. They seem to be fixed where they are by his actions. And uh, he, he's there in the end, once he's taken his outer garment off, he, he's looking like a servant clothed only in a loincloth. And uh, he wraps the towel around his waist and then he pours water into a basin, and that's something that takes time. And then he moves from one man to the next, washing the disciples' feet and drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And, and if we were to look into that room and see what Jesus was doing, you, you would see him moving from one to the other, washing their feet. Here is the humility of the master. Here is something that he does for them. And uh, he acts decisively in the presence still of the betrayer. And he shows them his great love. Um, the, the rendering of verse one in the passage that uh, you and read spoke about our Lord loving them to the end. And that, that is correct. He, he continued to love them despite all their failings to the very end of his time with them. Um, the NIV says he now showed them the full extent of his love because the word end is not so much a time word as a, as a fullness, a completeness. He, he showed them just how much he loved them. He loved them enough in the midst of their pride to wash their feet, uh, dressed as an oriental slave and to go from one to the other to undertake this task. This is the humility of the Lord, of the master. Uh, John makes it quite clear that when Jesus did this, he was fully conscious of who he was. Uh, he, he tells us in, in the first verse that Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. You know, sometimes you've been away on a trip and you're getting to the end of your time there and, and you're looking forward to, to returning home to see your family and your loved ones. Jesus knows that although the way ahead is going to be very, very difficult and painful as he suffers and dies, he knows that he has, is going to leave this world and, and go back to the Father, go back to the Father's house, go back to heaven. And he's conscious of that. And, and then John tells us again in, in verse 3 that Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up. So he knows that he has all authority. He has power. 
and uh, he's got a commission from the Father, which he is determined uh, to fulfill. And these things are possessing his soul. He, he knows that he's the eternal Son of God. He knows his relationship with the Father. He knows why he's come. And his reason for coming is related to these men. And so he gets up and uh, he acts and he shows them just how much he loves them. Uh, when he takes his place again, he, he tells them, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. There were times in the ministry of Jesus when uh, the Father spoke from heaven, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Jesus knows the Father's love. He is Lord. Uh, he is Jehovah, Jesus. And uh, so he gets up and he washes their feet. It is none other than the eternal Son of God in that room that night who is there with these men and uh, he is serving them and he's serving them out of love there's a contrast doesn't there with with us we are very conscious of our little positions uh, where we come in the pecking order by virtue of our age or our profession or the length of time uh, we have been christians or how much we know about biblical truth or whatever it might be. And, and because of that, we have an idea uh, about what we should do. Um, and yet Jesus, knowing his relationship with the Father, knowing where he's come from, where he's going, why he's come, he gets up uh, from the table and, and the meal and he, he takes off his outer clothing and he washes their feet. One man says, the Lord of glory on the one hand and Peter's dirty feet on the other. What a contrast, the Lord of glory. And isn't it wonderful that that's where the Lord Jesus Christ meets us. He, he meets us in our uncleanness. And so the humility of Jesus is seen in the, in the fact that he knew who he was. He was fully conscious of that. And then what he does, he, he does voluntarily and he does gladly. Uh, it isn't as if he sort of shrugs his shoulders, you know, in a, in a family sometimes when there's something to be done and nobody else wants to do it. And the person who usually does it, does it. They can do it sometimes with a sort of shrug of the shoulders. I suppose I'll have to do it. I'm, the, I'm always the one who does these things. But he's not doing it like that. He, he's doing it gladly. He's showing them how much he loves them. Uh, Paul in his letters to Philippians says that Jesus humbled himself and uh, he took the very nature of a servant. He didn't play the part of a servant. He became a servant when the disciples were arguing about which of them was to have to be the greatest. Jesus said, but I am among you as one who serves. He's the servant of the Lord and he's come to humble himself. And uh, his humiliation is amazing when you think of the different things that are involved in it. We've been thinking over Christmas of the incarnation and of how our God was contracted to a span, incomprehensibly made man. The Shorter Catechism speaks about the humiliation of Jesus, him humbling himself. And it says that his humiliation consisted in his being born, and that in a low condition uh, to an ordinary family, in very poor circumstances, he was made under the law. He was undergoing the miseries of this life, the wrath of God and the cursed death of the cross. In his being buried, and continuing under the power of death for a time. All these things involved our Lord in his person, the God-man. And uh, he humbled himself for a season. He came into this world and he, 
he came as one who serves and he's doing it voluntarily, not, not under any pressure or compulsion or with any reluctance, whatever, because he's showing them the full extent of his love. Right to the end, he shows them that love. And the, the washing of the disciples' feet is an element in that humbling of himself. But, but it's also a, a symbol of all that that humiliation would involve. Um, Jesus spoke to the disciples and uh, he said that he came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And the salvation of his people could only be accomplished by identifying with them, with us, uh, in our guilt, in our pride, in our fallenness. Uh, and as he washes their feet, uh, it's a picture of what he comes to do when he, he doesn't simply uh, take their bodily uncleanness, dusty feet or muddy feet, but he identifies with those dark aspects of our life and of our character. Uh, the things of which we are ashamed, the things which make us feel guilty. One of our hymns says, he took my sins and my sorrows, he made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. He, he, he was made sin for us who knew no sin. Sin was something he knew nothing about. He had no sinful nature. He had never committed sin. But he was treated as a sinner. And he became a sin offering. All we like sheep, the, the prophet says, have gone astray. The Lord has laid on him what the iniquity of us all. And so as we see Jesus here washing the disciples' feet, he, he's showing them just how much he loves them. And there's a cost to him in doing that, and a, a cost which is yet to be paid in full when he goes to the cross. Uh, but this humble act of washing their feet, revealing his love for them, is, is a picture uh, of what he's going to do when he atones for their guilt. And uh, when by his cross he merits the, the coming of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, of whom he speaks later while he's with them in the upper room, the, uh, the counselor, the comforter, the helper, who will come in his place and uh, who will be with them forever. And he will accomplish that by his death on the cross. And so the, the humility of the master is amazing. And, and this picture of him washing their feet is something which helps us to understand uh, how intimate it is as he engages with them. He has to actually wash their feet. If you've ever cared for a, a child or uh, for an adult who is unwell and you care for them in all the personal needs of their care and you wash their feet, you dry them. And here is Jesus washing and drying them with a towel. He's touching them. He's identifying with them, not just their outward dirt, but the, the pride that is in their hearts. And it's, it's a lovely picture of our Lord, humbly showing them just how much he loves them. And then we move on to the humility of uh, the disciples, the humility of those who follow the Lord Jesus Christ. How are we, how are they to be made humble uh, because Jesus says that he is a Lord and teacher. And he teaches not only by his words, but also by his conduct. He is a great example of, of how uh, to live. And if you ask, well, well how are we humbled? Uh, then the first thing is by admitting that we need to be washed by the Lord, that we are sinful people that we are guilty sinners, that we have offended God by breaking his laws. And despite all our promises to do better, we've continued in our sinful ways. And to be brought to that point where we say, well, Lord, please forgive me, that decisive first washing. Because as Jesus goes from one to the other around the disciples, 
he comes to Simon Peter. And Simon Peter was often one who spoke up and sometimes he had wonderful insights. Uh, at other times he didn't understand. Uh, and here he, he doesn't fully understand what is, what is going on. Because uh, when Jesus comes to him, Peter's watched him washing the feet of the others and perhaps he thought, well, what are they, why aren't they stopping him? Why are they letting him do this? It, it's altogether out of place. Uh, but Peter then says, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus gives a, a gentle reply at first. He says, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. He, he says to Peter, look, just let it be. Later, when you look back upon these events in the light of the cross, then you will understand what it's all about. Uh, but Peter is not going to wait. And he says quite clearly, no, you shall never wash my feet. I'm not going to let you do it. Uh, I'm going to refuse it. And then Jesus asks much more firmly. And he says, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Unless you're washed, you don't belong to me. That's one of the basic terms of the gospel. Unless we acknowledge our need to be washed by the Lord Jesus Christ, we don't know him. We don't belong to him. If there's never been a time in your life when you have acknowledged to the Lord your need for forgiveness and for cleansing, then you don't know him. Peter does know him. And uh, when he realizes that he has to be washed, he says, then, Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Wash me thoroughly. Wash every part of me because I want to be yours. I want to have part with you. I want to belong to you totally. And uh, Jesus says, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you. So he's saying these men have already uh, come into that relationship of being forgiven and cleansed by him. They have been bathed except Judas, uh, who is still uh, in the company. And so there is this decisive washing. And you know, that's how God begins to humble us. I can remember a time as I was going to, to church as a teenager and uh, trying my best to serve the Lord in many ways, still struggling with sin in lots of ways, but, but wanting to be a committed Christian and uh, wanting to do the best I could. And when I first heard the gospel and began to understand that we are all sinners and need to be forgiven, I remember a bit of a struggle to admit that. Uh, that's the kind of struggle that, that Paul talks about, that our own righteousness, our, our own good works. And, you know, the longer we live, the, the harder it is to come to that point of acknowledging that we need to be washed, we need to be cleansed, uh, that, that even our best efforts, only the even the best things we do, our righteous acts are, are stained by self and pride and sin. Now we need to be washed, that's a decisive beginning, that humility. We are what we are by the grace of God because he has graciously forgiven us. And Peter needs to know that. And when you look at Peter and what he says, if you ask, well, is what Peter is saying arising from humility in him. He's sort of saying, I couldn't possibly let you do this for me because of who you are and who I am. It might be possible to think that, but, but it isn't that. It's, it's not humility that makes Peter say that, it's pride. In effect, he's saying, well, they've let you do it, but I'm not going to let you do it. And one man says, it is not humility to refuse what the Lord deigns to do for us or to deny that what he has done, but it is self-willed presumption. The truest humility is to receive reverentially and thankfully and to own the gifts of grace. Then Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and my feet as well. Wash me, savior, or I die. We will sing at the end of the service, a well-known hymn by Isaac Watts. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt 
on all my pride, seeing the cross of Jesus, who it is, who is dying, why he is dying, reveals the pride, that contemptuous pride uh, that is in our hearts and that has to be dealt with. And it's dealt with at that point where we acknowledge our need. Have you ever done that before the Lord? Say, Lord, I, I, I've known about you. I, I understand something of your word. I've been going to church. I've been reading my Bible and praying. But actually what I need is your grace. I need to experience your love and to realize just how much you love me and that you went to the cross to die for my sins and no longer to say, I don't need a savior. I don't need the cross, but I need you. Please accept me as I am and forgive me. Have you ever prayed that uh, from your heart? It's a prayer that God always answers and he accepts us and he receives us. So that's where humility begins. It's in that first step of acknowledging we need to be washed by the Lord Jesus. But then humility also grows in us as we realize that in addition to that once and for all of, of washing at the very beginning where we are put right with God, that every day of our lives, we need to be washed and we need to be cleansed. Uh, Jesus speaks about a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean. He's talking about the difference between a total cleansing and a partial cleansing. And, and that's, of course, what he's going to do. They, they've come in on the roads, they're dusty or muddy, and, and their feet need to be cleansed. And he's talking about that that ongoing washing and cleansing, which, which every believer needs. And that too is a humbling experience. When a person first becomes a Christian, very often we say, well, uh, I'll never do those things again. Uh, and now I realize the love of the Lord for me and what he did on the cross for me, that's going to be the, the reason why I live for him with every part of our be my being. And then it isn't long before we realize that we we're failing him often, regularly, doing the same things again and again. And we've got to keep coming to the Lord and, and this time praying as, as children of a heavenly father, our father who art in heaven, forgive us our trespasses. Father, I've sinned again and again every day. And it's a humbling thing to, to acknowledge that. You know, sometimes when we're, uh, with other Christians, we, we get the impression that somehow some of us don't need that because we've been around for so long and because we've got that outer appearance of sanctity. But in our hearts, we know that that's not what it is. We still struggle with all kinds of, of sins and every day we need his forgiveness. And that's a humbling thing. Despite all we know, despite all the promises we've made, every day we need to wash our feet and to be cleansed and uh, it happens so readily and our progress seems so slow. When our children were young we often went on camping holidays. Uh, sometimes we would go to uh, campsites where there were very basic facilities, just a tap really, and uh, we would enjoy a week. Other times we would go to facilities that were, had a, a place to sh a shower block, a place where sometime during the week you could go and have a shower. And one of my memories of those places is that you, you decide, well, I'll go and have a shower now and freshen up. And you go into the shower block and they'd have a curtain and uh, you'd go and you'd have your shower. And the moment you drew the curtain back in order to, to go out, you, you'd find that there was a puddle uh, outside the, the shower cubicle. And because you were camping in a field, it was a muddy puddle. And uh, you had this dilemma. I've just had a, a shower and it's lovely to feel clean, but the first step I take out of the shower, I'm going to have to put either put my foot in muddy water or risk breaking my neck not to do so. And, and, and the Christian life is a bit like that. You know, we, we come to the Lord, we confess our sins, we know his forgiveness, and it seems almost the first step that we take. We're back into the struggle uh, with our old nature, with the world, and with the flesh, and with the devil. And it keeps us humble, it keeps us mindful of our constant dependence upon his grace. 
or perhaps a mother uh, has a toddler and uh, the, the toddler is just learning to to walk and enjoying doing so and uh, in the morning the uh, the mother dresses the, the toddler in uh, clothes and as toddlers often do they're very pleased with their clothes and they go out into the garden to play and they run into the garden and they trip and uh, often they seem to trip in a, a very muddy place and they fall headlong perhaps into the mud and they're, they're covered from head to foot and they start to cry and, and the mother goes and says what's wrong what's happened and they come in they're, all their clean clothes are, are filthy and they're crying and they're upset what does the mother do well the mother says well come in and uh, she takes the clothes off them and she takes them uh, to the bath or, or the shower and she washes them and cleanses them and and the, the toddler stops crying and, and she dries them with a towel and she says i've got some more clothes here and uh, she dresses them again and, and they're feeling better now and then she says do you want to go in the garden and play and they say yes and so she says well go out but but be careful have you known the lord sometimes receiving you when you've fallen flat on your face it isn't just the constant little sins but big sins sometimes and uh, we're distressed by them but we come to him and he washes us and he he reminds us that we're clothed in his righteousness and he sends us out to live again for him and, and you know that experience is something which often we're not conscious of what's happening in other people's lives but we know what's going on in our lives and that's how humility becomes part of us we had to be washed to begin with but we've also got a continual need for cleansing and then thirdly Humility is worked in us as we serve one another, as we wash one another's feet. Because having washed the disciples' feet, Jesus then applies what he has done. Do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. You see, when we've experienced the Lord's grace, we want to serve. We want to serve him. And uh, he's saying, well, when you serve me, you're actually serving one another. And that's how you live out the Christian life. You, you wash one another's feet. And it's in the present tense. It means we keep on washing one another's feet. It's not just occasional gestures, but a way of life, an attitude of wanting to serve something which characterizes true believers. Now, there should never be an occasion, for instance, in the life of the church where something needs to be done and nobody wants to do it, just like the disciples, not wanting to wash one another's feet. But Jesus says, now I've washed your feet. You should be ready to wash one another's feet. This should be a life-changing experience. As you've experienced my love and my grace. He's not talking about a, a literal washing of feet. There are some Christians who do that. They have ceremonies of washing feet where sometimes the leaders will wash the feet of some people. Now, I don't think that's what he means, but at least they are trying to apply the teaching of Jesus uh, in this passage. But he's talking about a, a humility which is eager to serve and is ready to do anything which will enrich the, the life of our fellow Christians. And indeed, more widely than that, as we have an opportunity to, to serve and to care. It's a characteristic of the Christian and uh, something which we gladly do. It, it's something that should characterize those who lead. Uh, the, the names that are given in, in some, sometimes to leaders, uh, the name deacon, for instance, or minister, all have the root meaning of, of serving. I remember preaching in a church in the north of England. And as I went in one morning to, to preach that morning, I saw a, a sign uh, in the foyer and it said nominations for church servants. And, and uh, when I, I met the officer, I said, oh, that's, no, what, what is that? Who are the church servants? And they said, oh, well, that, those are the deacons. Uh, and we thought that since the word deacon meant servant, instead of using the word deacon, we'd use the word servant and you know so what a an interesting thing to do you know in wales for instance if you if you used to have gone to a baptist church where they have many deacons and you're elected a deacon you 
you feel as if you've arrived. I'm a deacon in the church, but it doesn't have quite the same ring when you say I'm a servant in the church. But that's what Christian leadership is about. These men are going to be leaders. And they're going to serve by washing one another's feet, uh, putting their pride behind them and being ready to do anything which will really enrich the other. In Romans 12, there's a, a translation in the authorised version which talks about condescending to men of low estate. It's an unfortunate translation in our modern use of English. But the margin translation says, be, be willing to do menial work. Ordinary work, be ready to do anything uh, which enriches the, the life of a fellow Christian. Uh, when they're providing for widows, as they did in the early congregations, they talked about those who had washed the feet of the saints. Uh, they provided hospitality for traveling preachers. Uh, they had served others and uh, they were worthy of the support of the, the church and of the fellowship. And uh, so this image this picture of washing feet is is a picture of humbly serving our fellow Christians doing anything which will enrich them it may be giving them a lift uh, taking them to the hospital taking them to the doctors uh, taking them shopping uh, sending them a card making a phone call sending a text uh, perhaps providing some flowers or cooking a meal or helping with some practical task that needs to be done when perhaps there is a, a lady on her own and she just knows, needs something simple done in the house and, and there's somebody who can do that. And that's the kind of thing which Jesus is saying that we do, we do gladly for our fellow Christians. Um, sometimes I've seen churches, for instance, where when they need a, a job done on the church building, um, perhaps a redecoration, then, then they go out to professional decorators, uh, when there are men in the church who are very able at those skills and perhaps don't have speaking skills and they, they're not able to do those things, but they would gladly do those practical tasks. But they don't have the opportunity to do that because all that work is put out to others and there ought to be many opportunities in the church for service, which every Christian will be glad to do anything that will enhance my, my fellow Christians' lives and and enhance the fellowship of the church. And Jesus is saying, well, if I've done that, if I've washed your feet, now you should be ready to keep on washing one another's feet. When I was in ministry in North Wales, um, we had a young man who was converted and uh, he started coming to the church and uh, it was lovely to see the way he was eager for ministry and he was growing. And one day he, he gave me a letter uh, and in the letter, he said this, he said, I realize that, that as a, a pastor, you've got lots of things to do. Your life is very busy and you have family responsibilities as well. And he said, I've been thinking about that. I, I'm writing to tell you that if there's anything I can do to help you, I'm ready to do it. If you want me to cut your lawn, I'll do it. If you want me to wash your car or anything else, just tell me and I'll do it because I want to be a help to you. Do you know, as I read that letter, it was a remarkable letter and to my shame I, I said to him thanks very much for that offer but I'm, I'm okay thank you I can manage. That was my pride not being willing to admit that I needed to be helped but the spirit in which he operated that was a wonderful spirit. I, I've never had another letter like it um, but he had just saying how can I serve the Lord and he wanted to, to be of help and of service to me. It's a wonderful thing when a fellowship is characterized by that kind of spirit, eager uh, to serve. But often we know more than we do. And yet Jesus emphasizes that, that it's all about doing in this case. Once you've been washed and are being washed daily, then we should follow the example of our Lord and do as he has done for us. He says, I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Uh, first of all, he's saying that, that we are to be like him. I'm sure that's one of the things that most Christians would say. If you said to them, well, what do you want to be? Most Christians would say, I want to be more like Jesus. Well, this is what he's like. And he's telling them really, now I've done it for you, you should do it 
for each other. Are we like him? Are we becoming more and more like him? And then we often pray, don't we? Lord, please bless me. And I wonder sometimes when we realize what blessing is, what we expect. Well, Jesus is saying that when we know things and put them into practice, we are blessed. Sometimes we pull back. We don't want to do it. We don't want to have the trouble of it all. But actually, as we seek to be like our Lord, who has washed our feet, who has taken our sins and carried them away forever, and we begin to serve one another, then we know his blessing personally and as blessing in the life of the church. So the humility of the Lord and the humility of his servants uh, is, is a characteristic of those who have experienced the love of Christ and uh, who have come to know new life in him. And he said to his disciples, and he says to us, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Amen. <laughs>